Good afternoon and welcome to the Appellate Division First Department. We have read your briefs, the record, and are familiar with your cases. So when I ask for your time, please ask for what you need, not what you want, as the time clock is for you, not for us. When we have more questions, we continue over the time clock, okay? All right. People versus Felipe Rivera Cruz. Okay, again, ask for what you need, not what you want. Five and one and five. American Transit versus Melendez. Submitted. R. Mark versus Kimberly is submitted. Van Poy Corp versus Soliel. Petitioner? Hmm. Petitioner has not appeared. Do you still wish to argue or would you like to submit? Thank you so much. Case is submitted. Dunn versus 6 8 St. Nicholas Realty. Any respondent? Okay. Four minutes. People versus, and forgive me if, my, if I mangle this name. I'm going to give it the old college try. People versus Gomez Cod Aweed. Okay, I'll give you five and one and five. Master, Mastracola versus Alcoff, and this case will be called first at request, request of counsel who is catching an airplane. All right, appellant? A appellant <laughs> Okay. Four and one and four. Again, ask for what you need, not what you want. Goldman Sachs versus New York City Tax Appeals Tribunal. Council? Okay, five and two and five. And Tech Engineering versus Dewberry. Well, obviously, you have no opponent, so give me what you need to illustrate your point. And it ain't going to be 15. Okay, I will give you five minutes, okay? People versus Tristan Wilson. Five and one and five. Board managers, board of managers 150 East versus Vitruvius Estates. Granted, five and one and five and one. Thank you. O'Rourke versus NYCHA is submitted. Republic of Haiti versus Preble Rich Haiti is submitted. Catan versus 119 Christopher LLC is submitted. Called out of turn, Mastracola versus Alcoff.
<clears throat> Ma'am, please come to the podium. Yeah. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honors. Good afternoon. Having been trained as a parent coordinator for a number of years, the holy commandment of parent coordination work is that you must abide by the terms of the contract. You have no power to decide an issue which you have no power if there's no power given to you in their agreement. So the co parent coordinator was supposed to hash out any conflicts. Is that correct? That was under the stipulation? So they were supposed to assist, if you look at the section on the calendar, assist in the calendar. They were supposed to assist in other areas, but they were not to make any major decisions. They were not to have any input on major decisions. And they were given, no, the parent coordinator was given no power to, to make a decision. So how did the parent coordinator go beyond the, uh, the limitations or the role set forth in the stipulation in this case? Okay, so the parent coordinator had a calendar that he or she was supposed to work with the parties on. That parent coordinator was supposed to use the contract in order to determine what that calendar would be for the following year. The parties had an opportunity to present to the parent coordinator ideas about how the calendar should be uh, determined, uh, and the parent coordinator could take those into consideration and in fact, make a recommendation, but the recommendation was not binding. But, but the larger parameters were set in the stipulation from several years before, right? I mean, the parent coordinator did not have the authority to propose a calendar that did not comply with the parameters of the, of the uh, stipulation of, uh, from before. That, is that correct? That's correct, and, and that, she did That's it. what you're complaining, that the parent coordinator, in this case, came up with a schedule that did not uh, fit within this, the, the, the scope of the uh, stipulation that she was supposed to work under, right? Well, she didn't just do that. She did that in an egregious manner, multiple areas of the calendar. But in addition to that, she issued an email advising the clients in May that she was making changes to their custody and access agreement. Counsel, isn't this the second parent coordinator? The first coordinator, the first parent coordinator, which the parties agreed to, resigned, because I think I read in a record where he just could not work with the, the mother anymore. And this second parent coordinator is something that the parties agreed to, and I think the mother actually put forward her name. Am I incorrect in that? Actually, that is incorrect. Um, Dr. Smirling, if you look in the transcript, was recommended by Judge Hoffman. Uh, my client had never met with Dr. Smirling, didn't know Dr. Smirling, uh, but I do understand that her lawyer at the time agreed to it. But I'd like to point out what Dr. Aronson says about this very agreement, and I'm quoting respondent's grief. Dr. Aronson says, with respect, I have no authority to enforce this parenting agreement. It's in the record. Dr. Aronson said he had no authority to enforce it, and Dr. Smirling did not. Indeed, with respect to the parent coordinator's authority in general, Article 1, Paragraph 1.4 D5 of the agreement specifically states, for an avoidance of any doubt, nothing in this agreement is intended to interfere with or restrict the parent coordinator from providing feedback, making suggestions to the parties. In no event, however, shall the parent coordinator make a recommendation as to a major issue. It's clear she does not have the power, and yet she usurped that power, and she um, took the position that she had the power to change the custody and access agreement. If you read this agreement, it was intricately designed by the parties. It was not your standard vanilla parenting agreement. They made certain decisions about how they wanted their child to move back and forth. Sometimes those decisions turned out to give one party or another in any given year more or less time. But as the parent coordinator, she was bound to enforce those decisions, and she failed to do so. Thank you. You'll have a minute on rebuttal. Thank you. Counsel?
You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, John Teitler on behalf of Plaintiff Respondent David Mastricola. Um, I would, in response to some of the questions that uh, the court has posed, I'd like to address those. N number one, um, it's very clear, and I realize um, that counsel for uh, appellant is the, is the sixth lawyer representing her. She wasn't present in court. Counsel, that's not germane to any issue before us. Well, the only reason why I say that is that she wasn't the counsel that was on the record with respect we to- We all know that. We've read the record. Okay, with respect to the suggestion as to who, the issue of who suggested Dr. Smirling, at page 484 of the record, it is explicit. Uh, Marilyn Chinitz, who was then counsel, specifically suggests three names. The court had suggested a different name, and Ms. Chinitz suggests three names. The third of them is Dr. Smirling. The page that counsel refers to is- Does, does would that, the fact that, even if that is true, that doesn't change our analysis. Oh, I understood, I just wanted right? to address that. I just wanted okay. to address that point, thank you. The second point that I'd like to address is section 2.22 of this agreement specifically provides that this agreement must be applied each year, a calendar must be set forth. And there's an exhibit A to this agreement, which and is counsel, the initial. I have a question about that. Yes. Ms. Alcoff submitted a, pro a proposed schedule, which was her obligation under the agreement. This was her year to do the first draft of the schedule. I didn't see anything in the record where your client ever identified any way in which the mother's calendar was not consistent with the party's agreement. I didn't see anything in the, in the papers below, and I didn't see anything in your appellate brief. So am I correct that you don't contend that the mother's, so you would acknowledge that the mother's proposed schedule is entirely consistent with the party's agreement, is that correct? No, I, I don't think that's correct, Your Honor. Well, what that's... in the record shows that you ever contested that? Section 2.22 explicitly provides. No, I'm asking what, what, what statements were made by your client or by you at any time in the record showing anywhere that the mother's proposed schedule was deviated in any way from the Stipulation. But Your Honor, there, there are two things. One was the summer schedule. No, I'm not talking. The summer schedule is in before us. That's resolved. I'm talking about the so, year so the schedule. Overall, so each year it goes back and forth. They, they get the school calendar. One parent is supposed to. I know the procedure. Yes. She submitted a year calendar. Yep. I'm asking where in the papers below or before us you or your client indicated any deviation by the mother from the stipulation in the calendar that she submitted? Because it would run afoul of 2.22, which explicitly says- Where did you say that in the record before us? Uh, I believe throughout the record, it's clear that there's, this, there's discussion back and forth. I could not find anywhere where you or your client identified any way in which the agreement did not conform to the to the party's stipulation. Okay, the party's Can you identify any page where that occurred? Well, I would say in the record at 115 is the actual agreement, which says those schedules have to comport with the best interest right. of the council. Council. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to really implore you to listen to my colleague's question. I believe the answer is nowhere in the record did I oppose or say that there was anything wrong with the mother's schedule. That's the answer. And your attempt to avoid giving, the only answer you can give is a problem. So let's try it again. Yes. Where in the record on this appeal did you ignore that light? Did you say in any way that the schedule proffered by appellant mother was in violation of any of the specifics in the stipulation. Well, That's the specific question. So in the underlying motion papers, the, the issue originally arose with respect to the summer schedule. The, the request by the mother in the summer schedule was, was inconsistent with the terms of the but agreement. the summer schedule is not now before us. With no, regard okay. to the schedule that is before us, it seems to me that your implicit answer to my colleague's question is that you have not indicated anywhere that there's a deviation from the stipulation in the schedule that, that Ms. Alcoff proposed. Well, I, I, Your Honor, 
and I'm trying to, act, and I don't, I'm not trying to not answer your question, I'm trying to think if I can think of a particular page, but what I would say is, and again, I, 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 don't, I don't want to run afoul of anyone's Go ahead. instructions. Answer the question, please. But what I would say is, the way that this process was supposed to work is you were supposed to look at the school calendar. You were then supposed to look at the actual contract, and you were supposed to take into account specifically issues regarding transitions and issues regarding time away from the other parent. Yeah. And those were to control. I know that. And the mother submitted a schedule which she, which she claimed she believed did that. I'm asking you if you identified any specific way that her proposed calendar was inconsistent with the agreement that she and your client entered into. Yes, because it, it wasn't in the best interest under 2.22. So it wasn't that so the only provision, so you're claiming okay. it was not in the best interest, but you can't, other than that, identify any specific provision okay. of the agreement that it was inconsistent with. Okay, well, I, again, at the end of 2.22, it references Exhibit A, which is the first schedule, and it says this, this calendar trumps the language of the agreement. Then it says this calendar is supposed to be updated each year. And the way it gets updated each year is when you get the school, as you know, when you get the school calendar, you... Council, can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> the schedule proffered by the uh, parent coordinator is in violation of the stipulation, is it not? I don't believe it is. Really? Yeah, because I think, as it specifically says in 2.22... See, if, if all you are going to... Uh, rely on is the best interest of the child? Is that issue to be determined by a parent coordinator? Is there anything in the stipulation that says the parent coordinator has the last word on what is in the best interest of the child? Is that not something that a court generally determines? The court and doesn't this stipulation permit and in fact call for the court? to determine what a proper schedule is if the parties cannot abide by the stipulation as written. Yes, Your Honor, the court explicitly found that the parenting coordinator did not have and does not have the authority to make the decisions. And the court explicitly found that it was making the decision on the, base, on the best interest of the child. So there was not a delegation. It's specific. Okay. In the decision, Justice Hoffman says, he actually says one of the problems with this agreement is it doesn't have teeth. The PC can't make the final decision. So, uh, so is the judge adding teeth after the fact? No, what the judge and is, is that proper? What the judge is doing is the judge is looking at the calendar as, as the judge is supposed to do. The parents go to the PC if they can't have an agreement. They're supposed to take into account age-appropriate tweaks to the calendar based on the school calendar. It's but is that what the judge said here? I thought I read something about the judge saying, I have no reason to not follow the parent coordinator. He said that he Isn't that flipping the entire burden on its head? He found that the mother failed in her burden to show that it wasn't in the that it was in the child's best interest to use her. I'm calendar. sorry, there was an agreement. So if there's a change, isn't the burden on the party seeking the change? Isn't it isn't it their burden? not the person defending the stipulation I entered into? I would respectfully submit, Your Honor, that under 2.22, which explicitly says, and if I could just read this sentence, the other parent shall then have two weeks to provide his or her feedback to the proposed calendar. In the event the parties are unable to agree upon the calendar, they shall schedule a meeting with the PC to resolve the extant issues and set the parenting calendar for the then <coughs> upcoming school year with both parents being mindful about what is appropriate for Gregory developmentally. But counsel, that provision doesn't happened. permit the parenting coordinator to substitute her own view of what is in the child's best interest for what's in the agreement, does it? Well, well Your Honor, so when it goes on to say, taking into account no, I know what it says, counsel. Transitions and, and time I, away. I know what the agreement, I've read the agreement. Yes, and so what the parenting coordinator did was met with the parties, made her counsel, recommendation. does as that a, provision permit the the parenting coordinator to substitute her own judgment for what the agreement ought to say in place of what the agreement actually says as to, for example, how much time the child spends with each parent on the parent's birthday weekend. So the, I believe that my, interpret, my reading of this agreement, I believe the appropriate reading of this agreement is that the parenting coordinator is allowed to weigh in to say, this is what I think should happen. It isn't binding. It isn't that, that then changes 
the stipulation. Well, that's right? what the stipulation says, though, Your Honor. Okay. All right. We've got your arguments. We're way over time. But I thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Your Honor. Counsel, you have a minute on rebuttal. Your you Honor. might want to lower that mic. <laughs> <laughs> Or That's grow. okay. <laughs> or grow a little. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, unfortunately, Judge Hoffman didn't do any of the analysis that he was required to do in terms of looking at this contract and seeing whether the parent coordinator had abided by the contract. And all he basically came up with was that uh, the mother should get along with the PC. Um, but I like to point out another issue that is of, of importance, and that is that our reading of the contract is that Judge Hoffman was required to appoint a new PC in this case, and his failure to why, do why was he? Why would he be required to appoint a new um, a, a new PC in this case? Because if you look at the terms of the contract, it said that if either party disagreed with who the PC was, they were to follow a protocol, and the protocol was to provide the other side with three possibilities of three individuals who of, who could be the PC. Well, they, they had a right, I mean, you had the right certainly to make the application before Judge Hoffman that you did, but he decided that it didn't make sense at that time to do it. I mean, he didn't grant your, your relief. Well, um, I, did he have, I mean, didn't he have some discretion to decide? I, I mean, I thought he said this was already the second person and he, he didn't want to replace her again so quickly. But do you think that that was an abuse of his discretion in making that determination as to whether there should be another person? So first, respectfully, I think if you read the contract, it doesn't give him the authority to return the parties to that PC. Even I'm just saying that under the stipulation, if anyone, if either of the parties uh, disagrees and no longer wants that PC, then that's it. A new one has to be appointed without any... Um, discussion or determination as to the basis for that party's now wanting a new uh, PC? That's correct. I think he had to appoint a new PC, and that's where... So, I could, so one, per, the one party could say, today, I want a new PC, new one is appointed tomorrow. Tomorrow I say, oh, I don't like this one, and you keep going on and on and on? Well, I mean, that's what the agreement... I that, that doesn't seem logical nor workable in our system. If every single family court matrimonial case had the ability to do what you are suggesting, our system was shut down. So then let me, let me frame it this well, way. Counsel, if, you, you, if the court, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If the court believes that that was the case, that he had an obligation which he failed to perform, he did nothing to determine whether it was in the best interest of this child to continue to have his parents work with this PC. My client worked for three years with this PC. We tried to work together with this PC. Counsel, These violations your... made it clear and her bias against my client Counsel, also. isn't your argument, your much simpler argument, that by she acted inconsistently with the agreement by making recommendations that she had no authority to make, and therefore that was a basis for replacing her. That's right. I agree. That's what we said. Thank Maybe you. Not as artfully as you. <laughs> no. Uh. Nice try, but no cigar. Thank you so much. You. Have a good day. Thank you. Next case on the calendar, People versus Felipe Rivera Cruz. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> You may proceed. Good afternoon. Uh, Nick Standish of Boyshiller Flexner, appearing as pro bono co counsel with the Legal Aid Society on behalf of appellant Philippe, Ver Ver <laughs> Philippe Rivera Cruz who is appealing his December 21st, 2012 conviction of murder in the second degree and his sentence of 25 to life. At Mr. Rivera Cruz's trial, he raised a defense of extreme emotional disturbance, or EED, and he called an expert witness to testify about his state Counsel, of mind. Counsel, yes. I, I want you to focus on whatever 
issues you think are your strongest issues on appeal? I'd like you to start there. Okay. Is, is so, yes. extreme emotional disturbance your strongest argument? My, my strongest argument is that the extreme emotional disturbance or, uh, defense raised by appellant and testified to by his, uh, his expert witness on direct examination did not open the door to a wide-ranging exploration of all the most salacious facts surrounding his previous convictions, and that that was a that was that sort of furthered the taint that had already occurred prior to that at the Sandoval conference, whenever the court uh, granted the entirety of the prosecution's application. Counsel, my problem with that is that the defense expert testified to things like that the stabbing was extremely out of character. Um, why didn't that open the door to prosecution proving what defendant's character was? So if, if uh, all of the statements for the extremely out of character statement and the fact that uh, Rivera Cruz had been at this uh, facility for a while without any violent incidents, both of those came out during the prosecution's uh, cross-examination of Dr. Yates. And so the prosecution, to the extent the door was open, opened the door itself. They asked her questions that she answered about uh, his his sort of past and then proceeded to then walk through the door that they opened. Is well, I, go ahead. I'm yes. sorry. Isn't that what she's supposed to do on cross-examination? Yeah. That's, that's, why that's that the was, whole point. That's the whole point of cross-examination is to get certain things out. When that witness testifies to things which you may not, you as a defense attorney may not like, that's not the prosecution opening the door, that's the prosecution asking questions and doing their job in terms of getting out the basis for the expert's conclusions. Doctor, they, the prosecution was absolutely entitled to test Dr. Yates's conclusions and to be able to test whether she was aware of certain things from uh, the appellant's past. However, you know, she had his rap sheet, she was aware of his convictions, she put those in her report and she testified that those were significant in reaching her decision. What the prosecution did was used that to then ask questions, bringing in all sorts of very inflammatory... Uh, Counsel, I'm sorry. You're suggesting that uh, the defense witness should be allowed to say, oh, this was an aberration. Uh, he's been in this facility for years and no, no uh, uh, violent outburst by him and not be able to test his other violent behavior in the past. No, uh, so Your Honor, the, um, the, the idea that he had had a, a 10 years of no crimes and 10 years of quote unquote peacefulness is not what Dr. Yates was saying. Dr. Yates was saying on the night of the killing that appellant was overborn with emotion she took into account the fact that he had had many crimes in his past. She did not deny that he had been convicted of... Yes, crimes. but saying, yes, he was convicted of X, Y, Z, right? Just the, just the name of the crime doesn't really provide any context for the nature of that crime, does it? That's, that's right. But the court has, within its discretion, a wide variety of the types of questions to allow. They could say, were you convicted of a felony in 1983? Were you convicted of a felony for bank robbery in 1983? Or were you convicted of armed bank robbery during which you shot two bullets into the crowd and took $55,000? And the court, it's within their discretion to balance the probative Counsel, value. Counsel, you're, yes. you're comparing apples and oranges. One, we're talking about the cross-examination of the witness concerned in the EED defense. But the Sandoval decision determination was prior to jury selection. And the Sandoval um, discussion was one thing. And now this is something else in terms of the testimony of the doctor. So the Sandoval ruling itself did grant the uh, prosecution the right to ask about, was it a bank robbery conviction? Yes. It also allowed them to ask about certain facts about all of the prison infractions, including the 1988 prison infraction for being involved in the killing of a fellow inmate. That was on Sandoval. Before the appellant testified in his own defense, which he did, the uh, expert witness was up there first, and that was when this, the, the door was determined to be opened, and that's when these types of questions were asked. Um, and that's a problem, why? It's, there, there is, even though, the, there is, okay, so the balancing between- um, I mean, this man yes. 
stabbed his victim 26 times. Mm -hmm. 27, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Correct. I mean, it's, it, this isn't a, a one-off, right? I'm reacting, I'm defending myself. This was a rage-filled act. The, the idea that this was a rage-filled act one -off, was not a one-off, that, that was what the jury could have decided uh, with, there was video evidence. Right, and can't the they witnesses. then consider whether he engaged in other extremely violent acts that perhaps should not have created such rage as, as the defense argued here? Right, there, there is still a balancing to be weighed by the court in terms of the reason for bringing in, under Dr. Yates' testimony, the reason for bringing in these past convictions was to, see, was to test her conclusions. It, is, it has to go to, so the, there are limiting factors on what can uh, come in when the door is opened. So the doors, the idea, did you take into account the fact that he used a gun during the bank robbery? That could be potentially uh, a way of testing that, but ultimately, the Sandoval balance is focused on, whether, on evaluating the appellant's uh, credibility on the witness stand, whether he's been willing to put his interests above the interests of society in the past. The test for uh, the door opening is to uh, allow the prosecution. Well, I think the test here is whether the expert's conclusion was proper based on whether they had all the information, right? Correct. So if all you know as an expert is, I was convicted of a, uh, 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 a bank robbery, but don't know that I took my gun and shot somebody two times, there are different kinds of bank robberies. There's bank robberies where you slip a piece of paper to the teller, you never show a gun. That's mm -hmm. one kind of bank robbery. And then your client was engaged in another. But you'll have time on rebuttal to okay. discuss more. Thank you. Counsel, five minutes. Um, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Your Honors, and may it please the court, Michael Yetter for the people. Just to touch on the EED expert issue, uh, our position is that the court properly exercised its discretion in allowing uh, the people to ask the expert about defendant's past crimes, precisely because uh, of the need to evaluate her opinion or allow the jury I to I want evaluate. to be clear now. The initial Sandoval ruling was what? That, could, that the, uh, the, the prosecution could go into the underlying facts or no? So the, the initial Sandoval ruling was one question about the nature of the conviction or adjudication that the court was allowing. So we and had a bank robbery and then um, we had a... Um, uh, arson, right? Something like that? I, I believe your honor is referring to the reckless endangerment, which was based on the I defendant. remember there was a 71-year-old woman in a... In a he, he had lit uh, his SR, our, oh, okay. SRO room on fire, and the, the charge ended up being reckless endangerment. Um, there was the uh, prison adjudication for the killing of the other inmate, and um, among the reckless endangerment, several other misdemeanor convictions, including uh, DWIs and offenses from Puerto Rico that involved... Um, uh, obstruction of, of officials um, and, and simple assault type of issues. That was the initial ruling. Um, and, and then again... Uh, how, how did the court's ruling with respect to allowing all of this Sandoval uh, information in through what some might describe as the back door of the expert? So it, it basically... Uh, uh, ensured that if the defendant took the stand, at that point, once everything is out, he had to take the stand, because he had to explain those things. Well, I, I don't disagree with Your Honor's statement. However, the defendant from the Sandoval hearing announced that he intended to testify to establish his justification defense. Yeah, but just, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. That changes all the time, right? So you say that sometimes as a defense attorney to posture in order to try to uh, throw off the game of the prosecutor. But my concern is, had the defendant not testified here, 
then the Sandoval ruling would have been accessed through the expert. Is that okay? Well, I, I don't have a specific case on, on, on that particular point, but I think as the record played out here, what happened was that the doctor in, in both her report and in her direct testimony said that things like criminal history and medical history in particular were uh, crucial aspects of her evaluation of third party analysis and engaging in this type uh, of analysis that she did and that's in her report. She also said that after completing her report, she received thousands of pages of information containing, among other things, criminal history and medical records related to the 2003 shooting. And she said that none of those things changed her opinion. So at that point, it, I don't think it was proper for the jury to be left with the impression that that's all that there was, and that it was, was proper for the prosecutor in order to allow the jury to evaluate the expert's opinion, to go through some of the things that she said re she reviewed and were not um, factors that weighed in, on her yeah, opinion. But the, the cross-examination of the doctor went beyond the Sandoval ruling because I think the prosecutor said, well, would your opinion or your conclusions change if you knew that the defendant set uh, a room on fire in which a 71-year-old woman was the occupant and she let you stay there when you were homeless and you didn't have a job? Or would your, would your conclusions change if you knew that he killed a uh, fellow inmate? So you're going beyond the, the Sandoval with those questions. That, that's right, Your Honor, and, and they do, in this particular case, sort of overlap because they're bearing on, on the same issue. But the, the judge was careful to issue a limiting instruction to the jury when that cross-examination started, saying you're, you're to evaluate this questioning for the purpose of, of determining the reliability to be accorded to the expert's well, I was going to ask that. Was there any type of uh, limiting instruction given by the judge concerning the basis or the reason for the admission of that testimony? So the limited instruction that occurred when Dr. Yates testified was on page 750 of the trial transcript. And then again, her testimony or the uh, subsequent limited instruction related to that was, I believe, uh, from 1070 to 1071 of the jury charge. So there were limited instructions. And I see my light is going on. Continue off. your sentence, please. We, we, we argued in our brief, and we believe still that to the extent or if there were error in these determinations based on the overwhelming evidence of guilt in this case, uh, separate and apart from defendant's past criminality, uh, the, the, the error was harmless uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, and, and we'd ask the court to affirm. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel? Yes, just to quickly address a few things that came up. So, um, first of all, I, I believe that the, the purpose of Sandoval and the purpose of door opening are not the same. Sandoval is to test the credibility of the defendant. Uh, the door opening is to test the, the witness's, or sorry, the witness's conclusions. Um, the initial Sandoval ruling, you can see uh, it, uh, it's in the hearing transcript. The, the pages are confusing, but hearing transcript 74 to 75, and then again, right before Dr. Yates testified, it was at transcript page 664, and there it was one fact, they were allowed to ask about the bank robbery, they were also allowed to act about facts about the bank robbery and facts about the uh, prison adjudications, including the killing. And I would say that one question, limiting to one question without further, you've seen the one questions that you can get in a lot in one question. Uh, so that's on the Sandoval. The, the final, the limiting instructions, there was uh, the ones given during the jury charge, I would just point to the language in Sandoval that says, you know, once, once the cat's out of the bag and the jury has heard that he set fire to an elderly woman, it's out of the bag. The limiting instruction is, is not going to remove that taint. So, thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. <clears throat> Counsel, I want to thank you for your pro bono service. Uh, please thank the firm. Uh, you have the gratitude of the court and I know of the people. Thank you. And counsel for the people, thank you too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lest I be criticized. Okay. Dunn versus 6 8 St. Nicholas. <clears throat> what happened? You're losing. You have four minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Gershman. I'm with Burns and Harris, and I represent the appellant Tyrone Dunn. 
Um, plaintiffs in this case made out a textbook prima facie case for summary judgment, and the defendants, the respondents here, um, pushed back in two ways. Neither stand up to scrutiny. First way that they pushed back was that they suggested that there was evidence disputing notice. But in fact, they did not present any evidence disputing the vast majority of Mr. Dunn's complaints after the October repair. So while in their brief on page nine, they assert that Mr. Jimenez, their witness, uh, testified that there was, quote, only a prior ceiling leak, only a single prior ceiling leak. In fact, he testified that he was aware of one work order. Nor did Mr. Jimenez testify, as argued on the same page, that Dunn never made any further complaints. In fact, if you look at their site, he testified that he does not know whether other employees named June or Tony received complaints. So there is, in fact, no I'll make it simple for you. The record here is pretty clear to me that he did tell people that there was a leak in the roof, there's a leak in the ceiling, and then the ceiling finally collapsed on him, unfortunately, causing injury. That's it. I mean, that's what I see in the record, unless I'm reading the wrong record, right? I mean, he told the super, he told people, they came and tried to fix it, they said they fixed it, it's still leaking, and then ultimately, the thing falls on top of him. Exactly. What else can you ask for? I'm sorry? What else can you ask for in that I, kind of case? I, I, I couldn't agree with That's you more. That's a hard question. <laughs> Uh, okay, I got it. I agree, and um, yes, and, and, and as I have mentioned, to wait for the red light on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, um, uh, the only other small point that I'll make is just that um, defendants' other issue is that they suggest that there's two separate causes for the leaks and then the collapse, and they provide zero evidence in the record to support that. Right, they say the pipe burst, but there's nothing to support a pipe, a bursting pipe or pipe burst. Actually, that allegation is based on nothing but hearsay. As you can imagine, I agree. So if there <laughs> are no further questions. <laughs> Thank you. Have a Thank good you very day. Much. <laughs> okay. People versus Gomez, Gomez Karawari. Karawi. I had it right the first time and I messed it up. Sorry. <laughs> You may proceed, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Brian First from the Center for Appellate Litigation for Yakimi gomez Cataweed. So, Counsel, do you know why the record is so thin? There, there's, like, nothing here. There's no uh, reference to the suppression hearing. There's nothing as to the agency defense, whether there was ever, it was ever brought up with the court in terms of an agency defense. Uh, I didn't see anything in the record concerning that. I'm sorry, what do you, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, Your Honor. The, in the record, in our papers? The record itself, in terms of the transcript of the proceedings we, with the attorneys and the court. You I think didn't see anything concerning an agency defense having been brought up initially before the court? At, at, at trial? Prior, prior to trial. Well, but the agency defense was raised at trial, Your Honor, so I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what, what, your, what your question is. Does there not have to be some type of discussion prior to trial where a defendant is going to be putting forth an agency defense? Uh, I don't believe so, Your Honor, but the people don't raise that in their, in their papers, and I believe they've waived any challenge to that. I know that, the, that an agency instruction was given, the court allowed the agency defense, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure wh why that... Um, how to respond to that because it doesn't seem to be, it was never an issue at trial. The trial judge didn't seem to take any issue with the fact that the agency defense was raised and gave the instruction, the jury instruction. Continue. Okay, so the trial court allowed the prosecution to admit $244 of unmarked currency. That was oh, so that happens every day on almost every single criminal sale of a controlled substance case I have ever seen. Well, Your Honor, no, I think that it, it, it appears in cases where it is relevant. And what these, what we, the cases that we rely on, that's Moven. Why is Jones. $244 such a prejudicial amount? I could see if he had $24,000 in cash in his pocket, that would be prejudicial. 
But two hundred forty-four dollars. Well, Your Honor, in Moven, why is that prejudicial? In Your Honor, Mo, the court in Moven found that three hundred and eighty-two dollars was reversible error, and so the same exact thing happened here. I, I understand that two hundred forty-four dollars is a little bit less, but it it, it 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 creates the same harm. And what the court has said in the past is it creates the obvious improper inference that he is a drug dealer. That is why this, there's no possible reason that this currency should have been admitted. And that's what Moven, Jones, and Reyes say, is that this currency is inadmissible because it's irrelevant to any issue at trial, and it's reversible error because its primary, its only purpose is to show that the defendant So where pre-recorded buy money is recovered, as it was here, right? Say again? Where pre-recorded buy money is recovered, as it was here, am I correct? Well, are we twenty. Am I correct that pre record This is not a trick question. You are twenty dollars. The evidence showed that twenty dollars. twenty dollar bills. I right? disagree with that, Your Honor. But but just I'll, one. Just one. The evidence showed just one, Your Honor. But I'll, I'll finish your question and I will respond. I'm sorry. Well, it, it kind of interrupts the flow when you interrupt me. So why don't you continue? I apologize. So I guess with respect to the second twenty dollar bill, you have what we have is. Two officers testified. One officer testified that he believed only one bill was recovered. One officer testified that two bills were recovered. But there's zero physical evidence of that second bill. And with the, it, there's, there's not a photocopy, there's not a picture, there's not a, even a serial number jotted down. All you have- How is that relevant? It's relevant in multiple ways, Your Honor. Is it relevant to the, to the sufficiency and the weight point? Because the fact that only one $20 bill was, pre marked 20 was recovered, showed that Mr. gomez Cataweed is had the more credible account because it shows that he used that $20 bill to buy the drugs from the third party dealer. That's why it's relevant, Your I thought he also testified that he went to a store or something and bought some mm -hmm. other things. He did, after, it, that, 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 was after the, that was before the fact that he testified and there was evidence that he used his EBT card at, at the store. He didn't use cash, the, he, the receipt came in to evidence of, his, of, how, of how he made the purchase at that bodega. Even if, in fact, you're correct that you, you could argue that the lack of the recovery of that second marked $20 bill uh, substantiates your client's story, the jury was made aware of this, were they not? Yes, Your Honor, the jury... So why then would the jury, why do we not conclude that the jury simply uh, came to their own conclusions as to whether... Um, they believed him or not in terms of what happened to that other $20 bill. Yes, Your Honor. Of course, the jury can make that determination, but there's two points that I'd make to that. First, this court, of course, has its own power to make its weight of the evidence determination and to overturn that. But second, this is also relevant to the first point, which is the currency, to, because the evidence in this case was not overwhelming. So because that evidence, because it's, it's indisputable that that currency was irrelevant and should not have been admitted. So the only question is whether it was harmful. And so the second question goes to whether or not the evidence was overwhelming. So for both those reasons, I think that is an important factor. I see my time is up, unless Thank there's you. other questions. You'll have time on rebuttal. Thank you. You may Good afternoon, proceed. Your Honors. Elizabeth Schmidt for the People. May it please the Court. So my question as to the agency defense was based upon the defendant's uh, application uh, that the, the court, um, excuse me, that the, the people failed to prove that the defendant was not acting as an agent. And so what I was trying to say was I did not see anything in the um, record that went to the emotion by him, by the defendant, or any ruling or anything of that nature concerning that agency defense. Your, your Honor, um, as far as I... As far as the record indicates, uh, that agency defense was first brought up, I believe, after the defendant testified. Um, and if there was any discussion prior to that, that's, that's not in the record. Uh, but moving on, I'd like to briefly rebut uh, something my opponent said. Um, the second bill was, in fact, recovered. The arresting officer clearly testified to that fact at trial, and clearly the jury credited that account. Um, but beyond that, moving on to the defendant's claim that the unmarked bill, or excuse me, the unmarked money was improperly admitted, this is not a reviewable claim, Your Honors. Uh, the record is inadequate. Um, there's no record of Judge Hong's decision to admit the money, um, and we don't even know if the defendant opposed that evidence. Um, he may have wanted that evidence in to corroborate his claim, 
that he had other money on hand. Wait a minute. Is that piece when of the, transcript just missing? I'm, I'm so Is sorry, Your Honor. piece of transcript missing? Or was the, I, I don't understand how it could be that there's no record of the admission of this exhibit. Right, that was my I question don't understand also. That. There was nothing, I, I didn't see anything concerning a suppression hearing because I would have thought that there would have been a motion to suppress the, um, the money as well as uh, any drugs that were recovered, but I didn't see any mention of a suppression hearing. I, I don't believe that was raised um, prior to trial, Your Honors. Um, and as for your question, Your Honor, about, um, I'm sorry, let me, let me think for a moment. Um, as for the, the transcript of Judge Hong's decision to admit the evidence, frankly, Your Honors, I, I have no idea. Um, I, I don't know if a court reporter wasn't present. No, stop. That is impossible. It is impossible under New York state law for a criminal case to proceed without a court reporter. So I'm not even listening to that argument, okay? Yes, sir. So Honor. explain to me why there's this gap in this information. Your, your Honor, I, I do apologize. I, I do not know. Um, so if the prosecution doesn't know, I, again, Your Honor, I, I am not the trial assistant. I, but I would, I would have expected, counsel, we've got dozens of appeals. I would expect that the attorneys before us have read the record. Your Honor, I, I have. So you don't know what's in the record? No, it's, it's missing from the record, Your Honor. So do we know why it's missing? This no, is Your 20, Honor. This I, is if I, I apologize if I was unclear earlier. I don't know why this piece of information is missing. Was any inquiry made by your office? Yeah, yes. you know, I was thinking about this. This is 2019, right? So I, I don't know whether that assistant is still in the office or not. But, you know, I would think as an appeals um, assistant, do you talk to the trial assistant? Yes, yes, I did, Your Honor, and she simply has no memory of this. Uh, I, again, I really do apologize. I will. We don't want to go outside of the record. It just seems strange to me because also you just said that the other twenty dollars was recovered. Your adversary said that only one twenty dollar uh, mark twenty dollars was recovered. Yes. Uh, and there we have evidence that it was recovered, Your Honor. The arresting officer testified at trial that he recovered both bills of marked money. And um, were both bill, bills vouchered and shown at trial? No, Your Honor. Only one. So, so this officer was permitted to testify about recovering something that was no longer in evidence? Your Honor, at trial, the officer explained that it was police procedure to only use one of those bills uh, as evidence and to keep the other bill in But there would be a notation of that. And a photograph. I, my recollection is you always, they always took a picture of it. Yes. You don't do that anymore? They, Your Honor, in this case, a photocopy was taken of the marked bills before they were used in the buy and bust operation. Right, but my recollection is that what the officers used to do on the other covers is, you're correct, they would return the marked money, but they would take a picture of both the, uh, of, both, uh, of the marked money, and then they would voucher the picture, and then they would um, send over, and then they would turn that over to the defense, so the defense would know what was recovered. And, and in the Bronx, they didn't take a picture, but they did jot down the serial number in order to verify that indeed what was recovered as evidence was actually evidence. Yes, Your Honor. Um, in this case, the arresting officer testified that he took the photocopy that he had previously made before the operation. Um, he took the two bills of marked money. He compared the serial numbers from the photocopy to the bills he had seized from the defendant after his arrest and verified that both of those were the marked money. So this is in the record, and apparently there was no objection from the defense regarding this testimony? I, I believe that's correct, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. It's a mess. I'm giving you two minutes. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. So, so Do you make any inquiry about the missing record as to the 
as to when the other cash was admitted into evidence? Can you, sorry, I missed the first part of that. Did, did you make any inquiry to figure out why there was a missing transcript as to that part of the record where the four hundred and eighty whatever it is, well, the, the, four hundred dollars were admitted into yeah, evidence? Yes, Your Honor, I did. I contacted actually the trial the trial attorney uh, from the DA's office, and I also contacted the defense trial attorney multiple times. The defense attorney never responded to me, and the trial attorney did. The prosecutor did respond to me and said that they were unsure what what happened there. We did get the minutes from that day. I did, I did find the minutes from that day. The problem is, is it says that no hearing took place, but we know because the next appearance, the parties report the, the, the pretrial rulings from Judge Hong to the trial judge. So we know that there was a hearing that took place. We know that there's an adverse ruling at that hearing against Mr. gomez Catawid allowing that cash in. But the How specific- How do you even know it was adverse if you don't have it? Well, because I think there has to be a presumption that it's adverse when we have these first department cases that say that the prejudice of this currency anything? is manifest. I'm sorry, I, I'm having trouble understanding how we can assume anything if we don't have a transcript. Because, Your Honor, that I, this currency doesn't add anything to Mr. Gomez Catarides. Did you say there was an adverse inference charge, or did you just say that the ruling was adverse to your client? I said that the ruling was adverse, Your Honor. Okay, so that, made, that means that the, the judge made a determination that the property was, pro was uh, admissible. Should be admissible. Y yes, and that's what we know, is that Judge Hong ruled that the, that the currency could come in, and that is what Mr. gomez Catterweed's challenge is. But you're saying you were never able to unearth a transcript of the actual proceeding that made that determination. Yes, Your Honor, and I, I got the transcripts from every single possible date, we so found would you ask for a reconstruction, a reconstructive hearing, a reconstruction hearing, or something like that of the transcript? Or did you move to, um, did did you uh, appeal the uh, underlying decision and suppression hearing? Well, we're we're appealing it right now, Your Honor. And so I didn't see that. That 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 is well, that's point two in our brief. We're we're challenging the the admission of the of the currency. Um, of the $244 of unmarked currency. That's, this, that's our second point, and that's the first point I was But arguing. I didn't read that as meaning that. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't yeah, read it I that didn't way read either. I didn't read that as meaning that you were challenging the court's determination. I thought, court's it was, de I thought you were just challenging the court's determination as a trial ruling, not as a hearing ruling as well. No, I mean, the, the ruling that we're challenging is that this evidence was irrelevant. And it was I understand, that but counsel, I, we need okay. you to follow us now. Okay, I'm following. Because we are really focusing in on this lack, yeah. it seems, of a record of, uh, of the underlying suppression issue, mm -hmm. which, which clearly uh, uh, had impact on the trial ruling, mm -hmm. right? So, I don't know, it seems not crazy to me that I'd like to see the transcript of the hearing. Yes, Your Honor. I, I mean, and I made every effort to locate that transcript and the date in question, it says no hearing took place. Wait a second. That, you're referring to the date when Judge Hong admitted it into evidence. Was there ever before that a motion for, to suppress that money? Not a written motion. So we don't know. Was there we an don't oral know, motion to suppress? Know, we don't know if there was a motion, an oral motion made or a written motion. All we know is that there was a ruling from Judge Hong that allowed the currency in. And you didn't and get anything from defense counsel, defense trial counsel, just didn't he didn't respond. He didn't respond to you? He didn't respond to me. I said hey, that's, multiple that's emails. That's a big and, problem right there. I mean, Is that an 18B know. attorney? I believe so, Your Honor. So, okay. yes. I, I, so, but we do have the, the parties reporting to the trial judge at the next date what those, hearing, what those rulings by Judge Hong were. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have there. So at the very least, these transcripts are not m missing to any fault of Mr. gomez Catterweed, And so at the very least... I, yeah, the, they're not. But the problem is that we can't review them to make a determination. Well, Your Honor, I believe that an objective review of the evidence shows that Mr. gomez Catterweed doesn't gain anything by this currency being admitted. What, the that's first, not the, but that's not, the, that's not the basis for a determination. That's not what we look at, whether he gains anything or, any, or he does not gain anything. There could, in fact, be a reason, a tactical reason, for the admission of the, for his not opposing the admission of the $244 in U.S. currency. Well, that's what I'm no. saying, Your Honor, is I, I don't think that there is a tactical reason for but doing that. But we don't that know. What you think, you know, we have to know. And, you know, you said that the uh, trial counsel never responded. 
the trial counsel may have had a tactical, uh, tactical basis for it. But counsel also, didn't he in part base his agency defense on the fact that he bought heroin for, Calder for Calderon from another person, which he based partly on the fact that he had other cash on him? Well, Your Honor, so this, this is... Why, it seems to me that the presence of that money could have been assented to by defense counsel because it was actually helpful to his agency defense. Your Honor, and this is the same, this is the argument that the people make in their papers, but the, they confuse what Mr. gomez Cataweed's trial defense was. His trial defense wasn't about what was in his pocket, it was about what was not in his pocket, that second pre-marked bill. And so this is the same exact argument that was made in Jones, and the court there said no, that there was found oh, no his, significance. I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't clear, but his agency defense depended on his having enough cash to have spent his own money exactly. to go buy the other heroin. Well, it would only depend on him having $20 in his pocket. So the fact that, and that, and that $20 is already with the third party dealer. So the fact that he has $244 in his pocket, is, it doesn't help or aid that, that defense the in any money, way. The more money, the better <laughs> in terms of purchasing drugs for somebody uh, under an agency defense, what was, I think was the point. Okay. Anyway, we've got your arguments. Thank you. We have thank a lot you. to think about. Okay. Thank you very much. This is crazy. Guys. Goldman Sachs versus New York City Tax Tribunal. You may proceed. Your Honors, um, if it pleases Your Honors, Elise McLaughlin for Goldman Sachs, Peters Hill. So at issue here in this case is how to allocate gain from the sale of a partnership interest received by the petitioner under the New York City tax laws. What the... Um, it's, all about the it's all about the capital gains, right? Let's just go right to the heart of it. It's the capital gains that Goldman Sachs did not report or pay the GCT on, correct? Correct. Right, yes. Now, that's yes. not a trick yep. question. Yep. No, no, no. I just had... Right. Yes. Okay. Yep. So, so the question I have is like, if, it, if Goldman doesn't pay the GCT for that capital gains, where else is it going to get taxed? So in, in, in this situation, the activities um, occurred over in London, so it could be taxed. In no, London. the only thing that occurred in London was a board of investment managers making decisions. All the actions were here in New York City. The benefit was the derived here. I mean, the benefit, the gains were here. I mean, you may, you may, I mean, we live in a global economy now. Decisions are made in caves, but the benefits are, are, are realized somewhere else. The, the gain is from, I believe, from many things. So the gain is partially from, from the activities of the partnership, which occurred in New York, from the... Sorry. So, you know, my problem is, is that throughout this in, these transactions that are here, the, the LLC is a pass-through, mm -hmm. and that other company, Claren is the, is the, the company that, that they invested in, Yep. It has a conduit to master fund, which then is a conduit to the petitioner. And they're paying taxes, the gains, I mean, they're paying taxes on the, on the monies that they're, they're realizing throughout their entire tax years. Because as a partner, they took it as a partnership, so of course the partnership doesn't get taxed, the members get taxed, mm -hmm. right? So the petitioners are paying taxes. And now all of a sudden when there's a capital gains, oh, we're no longer a partnership, we're, we're now a corporation and you can't tax us with a GCT. Does that kind of sounds odd? Okay, so if it was an individual, that is exactly what New York's rules say for individuals. Yeah, is that if you but have we're talking about not individuals? No, I'm just saying, but you're saying it, it seems odd. So I'm just saying that New York. No, 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 no. When we talk about individuals who own corporate stock, yes, I do agree with you there, right? Individuals who own partnership stock, it's the same thing in New York City. And New individuals York City. own partnership, yes, they're, they're members and they get taxed. Not on if they sell it. If they are, if you are a non, why should that be treated differently? That's the law in New York. That that is blatantly the law. A apparently not. 
So no, the, no. you have to convince us of that. And I'm explaining for New York, for, for, for individuals, that is blatantly the law. So, so uh, it may not be here, but that I, I could cite you to, to where it is in the, for individuals. Well, can't, can't, individuals. What is the citation to that? Because I certainly de didn't see a citation to that in the record. I think you're I actually do the, have it. You're taking the position that if an individual is a partner in a company, is a partner, is a partner in a partnership, and realizes capital gains on the sale of the partnership interest, that the individual doesn't have to pay taxes on the capital gains? Yes, that is in the. Uh, I, 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 I I'm looking for the site the right record. now. I, if I have it, I didn't see is, that in the tax tribunal's decision. <laughs> what they might not have cited it, but okay. I, I am telling yeah. you so that that is it <coughs> one of your problems. Uh, uh, you know, at the, from the get-go in this case, that this is an Article 78 proceeding, and so the standard is very difficult uh, for the petitioner to set aside their finding unless it's arbitrary and capricious. And um, the, the tax tribunal did go through a very, very detailed discussion of all, all your different claims, all your different arguments, and came, uh, came back with reasons that they did not agree with it. And there is a court of appeals case from 1991, Allied Signal, which seems very, very similarly on point. So I wonder if you could address how we could find this as being an arbitrary and capricious decision and how this case differs from that Allied Signal case. Yes. So in Allied Signal, what the court said is there's two ways for, for allocating income in New York. There's a business allocation percentage and an investment allocation percentage. One is specifically applicable only to investments in corporations and governmental bonds or, or securities. And that says that you look at the, the investor, the investees factors in figuring where that income is from. I'll allow you for, to continue. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. For, for the business allocation percentage, you don't. You look at the taxpayer's activities. And if I would like to say in Allied Signal, the court specifically said that. The court, sorry, I do have it here, right here. Um, the court said that there is a difference between the, the that, that the business allocation percentage, you do look at the, um, the taxpayer's activities, not the other one. So there is the difference. And so all Allied Signal is saying is that it's But, but didn't that case kind of make a, a I, I thought it distinguished between uh, stock investments versus partnerships, which is, they're two different animals, right? Right. And here we're talking about a partnership, not stocks. Right, right. We're not talking about stock. Okay. And Allied Signal, so what Allied Signal said the investment allocation scheme is okay. This is what New York City and New York State have for, for investment allocation, for investments in corporations. We think this is okay to tax this income. It has a fair, fair connection to New York. With respect to the business allocation scheme. But, but what, what, what part of the, because I have the Allied Signal case right here in front of me. Yep. So tell me what page, what, what quote are you relying on that I, that I should look at and, and consider further? Here, okay, it is on page 76 to 77. And it says, unlike the taxpayer's BAP, which reflects the taxpayer's own activities in the city. The taxpayer's IAP reflects the degree of New York City presence of the issuers of the securities in which the taxpayer has invested. So because partnerships are not subject to the IAP, instead they are subject to the BAP, which has to be on the taxpayer's own activities. And if you look at how the, the city determines how to allocate... I, 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 Oh, sorry, go on. Mm -hmm. It says the BAP represents the arithmetic average of the ratios of the taxpayers' receipts, payroll, and property values within the city okay. to those of the corporation as a whole, not partnership. And we both know that partnerships and corporations are taxed completely differently, right? Right. And okay. So that statement refers to corporations. Tell me where in this decision I have a quote about how I should apply this case to a partnership. 
So when they say a partnership is subject to the BAP rules, not the IAP rules, and I believe... That says that here? No, I believe that says in the brief. If we cite, uh, okay. then I can find it, but we cite... Uh, but but okay. <clears throat> with all due respect to you, your brief is not binding authority. No, I know it's not. We <laughs> cite to the New York law that says that the investment allocation percentage is only applicable to corporations. If you look at the administrative code, it says that it is only... Right. I, we, we are not saying the opposite. The problem here is we have a partnership. Right. And that's why I'm saying Allied Signal, first of all, doesn't apply to our partnership. Allied okay. Signal is irrelevant. So, so let's throw out what I like. What does apply? So what does apply is the administrative code, the provisions There's on the no say, cases that have, have turned on this? Yeah, yes. Not, <laughs> the cases that have turned on this. Okay, what the administrative code does for the receipts factor is it says for if you have a business allocation percentage, which includes income from a partnership, flow through income, gains, anything else from a partnership. You look, it includes all the income that a corporation earns other than investment, the inve the investment allocation, other than investments in corporations. They said if it's from sales of tangible personal property, you source it to where the sales are shipped. If it's from services, you source it to Are we still talking partnerships? Because you keep yes, on... Yes, yes. This, this is for everything. This is I'm talking... Right. You keep on using corporations and partnerships interchangeably. And I don't believe they are interchangeable. They are not interchangeable. I agree. Okay. And so I'm saying that the general corporation tax for, for a corporation, because a corporation will be the entity that is subject to tax there. That corporation is subject to tax on all of its business income. Its business income can be from sales of property which are sourced to where they're shipped. It can be from services that are performed, which are then where the services are performed. It has a catch-all category, which is other business receipts. Because partnerships are not, gain from a partnership is not specifically mentioned in any of the other Council, categories. Council, all these arguments that you raised or you're putting up before us right now, this goes back to Justice Kapnick's point, were all presented before the tax tribunal. Because I'm, I'm listening to it, and this all is very familiar. It rejected every single argument you raised. So why is that arbitrary and capricious? Because if you're looking at the administrative code, and as Justice Manzanet said, you got case law that backs it up, you're still going back to the administrative code or administrative code there, and the regulations, the tax tribunal, hey, I avoided tax like the plague in law school. But these guys, that, that's them. They handled this stuff, and they're interpreting the regs and they're saying the capital gains that you guys got as a partnership is taxable on the GCT. And your resort to saying that it's a corporation, it's akin to a corporation, it's akin to a stock, a shareholder, they rejected every single one of those arguments. Okay, there's two issues. One is nexus, and there's one that's they, allocation. The right now part. we're talking about just the allocation. So, so if we talk about the allocation, the reason their, issue, their, their decision is arbitrary and capricious is because this is an other business receipt. There are only two cases out there that talk about other business receipts. Siemens, which is a court of appeals case, and Catalyst, which is a New York State tax appeals tribunal case. I think they rejected that. Are they you? did reject that, but, right. but so if you... What's arbitrary and capricious about them I, I, that? I think they're wrong in rejecting it. And the reason okay. I think they're okay. wrong... All right. All right. It's like, we have gone about... Seven minutes over your time, so you'll have time on rebuttal. Council, please don't show disrespect and exasperation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We spent a lot of time yes. with you, at least double the amount of time that I granted yes. you, so Thank you. I really don't okay. appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. You're right. You are Council, right. you may proceed. May it please the court, I'm just going to focus on the other business receipts, uh, which was part of the discussion before. Taxpayer relies on the case of Siemens. Siemens refers to earned income. Where is the income earned? And they say, well, when there's a loan, the income is earned when the lender does all the processing that is necessary to make the loan, to secure it, and receive it. There's no similarity to this case. There were no services rendered. There are no customers. So if we're going to look at the focus 
for where this money came from. That's $54 million worth of gain. There's only two places, where the taxpayer was or where the partnership was. It wasn't where the taxpayer was. The taxpayer just... It was in London. We were in London making the calls. <laughs> exactly. And it's important to note that the taxpayer had absolutely nothing to do with the increase in value in this entity. You know, what, 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 what troubles me, is, what concerns me, is that throughout the tax years, they were paying the partnership members, the members of the partnership, huh. okay, the petitioners, were paying the taxes on the monies they were receiving, the revenues they were receiving. And then, you know, looking like, okay, they're paying the GCT on it. Of course, they have to, at that point, acknowledge or at least concede that they're in New York, there's a nexus to New York, but they're paying the taxes. They're not complaining. And then all of a sudden, you get this, you know, great capital gains. Oh, no, we're not paying <laughs> GCT on that because it's, it's really a corporation. It's a shareholder, we're a shareholder situation. It's really, not, it's really a other uh, business. I mean, every <laughs> single excuse you could come up with that was rejected by the tax tribunal. And to go back to Justice Kaepernick, where's the arbitrary capriciousness in that? That's exactly right. And in fact, the New York City has a regulation that says a corporation is deemed to be doing business in the city by ownership of an interest in a partnership. There's no place else to go from there. I agree with the court. I agree There's with the world. And, and, and that fact was in existence at the time that this investment was made. Oh, yes. And the other thing is, where else is the tax going to be placed on this game? I mean... I don't see anywhere where the argument was saying I'm being double taxed by, by the single, with the single capital gains, right? I, I don't, where else are they going to be taxed about it? If it's not New York? Exactly. And that actually is a very important point, which I, want to, which I want to point out. In Allied Signal, in the Supreme Court's Allied Signal case concerning the New Jersey transaction, the taxpayer was present in New Jersey. It owned an interest in an unrelated corporation in another state. They weren't unitary. They had no relationship other than the ownership of the stock. The New Jersey entity sold the stock. New Jersey sought to tax it. The Supreme Court says, no, you can't tax that. There's no nexus to New Jersey. But now let's look at it from Ohio's point of view, or the other state's point of view. Michigan. And let's say, and let's say it's Ohio, because New York is in that position. <laughs> well, Ohio read the same cases as our allied signal Court of Appeals case and came to the exact opposite conclusion. They expressly rejected the New York Court of Appeals case and said, no nexus here either. Well, we know that it's taxable by the United States. It's got to be in one of the 50 states. This, in this case, it has to be New York. And I have nothing more unless the court has other questions. Thank you. Counsel? Counsel, I'm curious as to your response to that. What state then would uh, be responsible for uh, collecting a tax on that? If the company was based in Ohio, I think Ohio... No, under the circumstances. In this, in this case. case. In this case, if you have a London resident, does, does, does something happen? How does London, whose only connection to this is that a group of management investors have their office there? They have no connection to the actual company physically. Uh, all of the assets are here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and all of the uh, uh, profit is made here in New York. Okay. In, in the Siemens case, I want to they, explain well, I, I am, but I'm case. explaining why I think that the Siemens case holds a certain ruling, if I may do that, Your Honor. Go ahead. Okay. So for Siemens, what happened is there was someone who, this company was lending money. And the court had to figure out whether it would be sourced to where the customers were or where the, the lenders were, which was the place where the money was earned. In that case, the, the facts show, if you look through the record, that the company did virtually nothing with respect to those loans. They were loans to affiliates. They, it was essentially a passive holding company. They did almost... How is that like the case so, here? So my point is that nothing was happening where where the, the company was based, and the, the Court of Appeals still said the money was earned where the company was doing the very little that it was doing. And that is the same provision that is being 
being interpreted. Except that here, everything was being done in New York City. And the I only thing that was done was advice from investment managers out of London. Which I think is actually more than what's happening he was, than what was really? happening in Siemens. Because really? Siemens, if you look, they say it was that it was a passive holding company, and the court, the appellate division said there was very, very I few. I really, so counsel, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. I, I don't understand how you can say that nothing was happening here. <laughs> I, I, I just don't get it. How no, I'm not nothing... saying in New York City nothing's happening in Clarence. I, I, I'm not saying that. I agree That's that. what I was asking. I'm sorry. So on that one, I agree there are things here that are happening here. Everything was so, happening but, here. You know, I think there are some things that are happening out, but, I, but all I'm saying is that... The court or the, 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 the statute, the, the legislature has the ability to say how things are going to be taxed. And in this case, the only guidance they gave is other business receipts are taxed where they're earned, which according to Siemens, I think is not where necessarily the source is. If you look at Siemens, if you look at Catalyst, it's really where the, the, the company so the itself, the tax is arbitrary and capricious because it follows... The, the, the stated, the law as it states now, would you believe the law as stated now is incorrect? Or the case law uh, the, now is The incorrect? law has changed, but no, I, I think it doesn't follow the law as it was stated then. It doesn't follow what the law was. The law said, and, and if you look at Catalyst, I think in Catalyst, the New York State Appeals, the New York State Tribunal looked at this decision. The state had, the state had had, um, authority out there saying, ruling, saying, we think this should be where the customer is, we think this should be where the customer is. It's not where the taxpayer itself is performing any activities, it's where the customer is. And the State Tax Appeals Tribunal looked at that and said, you know, they didn't want to do it, but they said we are constrained to follow Siemens because in looking at where other business receipts are allocated, it should be where they're earned and our holding. And Siemens says that's where activities are being done on behalf of the taxpayer. Counsel, and that's why I think it's I, My right. colleague has a question. Let me okay, I'm ask sorry. You mm -hmm. from a slightly different tack. It seems to me the logic of your position is that your client is subject to taxation in London for this. And my guess is that if you were facing the possibility of taxation in London and taxation in New York City, that that would have been raised in your papers and it wasn't. So am I, so it seems to me that you're not being taxed in the UK and that if in fact New York City doesn't levy taxes against you, this capital gains will not be taxed anywhere. Is that your position and that that's correct? I don't know if it was subject to tax in London and I'm sorry, that is something I should know. That so is absolutely know, so then, something you would have known. <laughs> Come on, uh, no, it, I, thank you, thank you. Okay, but I, I okay. all right. Okay, thank you very much. And tech. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Stephen Cohen. I represent Dewberry Engineers, the respondent in this matter. As the court is aware, there are three separate and distinct appeals in this case. Uh, motion number three was appealed, which was a motion that was actually filed by Dewberry and denied. So we don't know what to address with that other than to say that they're not Counsel, the party. Counsel, let me ask you a question on this case here. The subcontractor seems to be out, out, out hang, hanging to dry in a sense. I mean, they're not going to get I'm, paid. I'm sorry, Your Honor, can you? The subcontractor here doesn't get paid? I mean, th that doesn't seem like there's something. I mean, I'm reading this contract, and it's like, what? How? Do, pay if paid, and then they can't sort of lean. Now they're not getting paid? Yeah. There's well, no remedy for them? There's, there's no recourse? There is recourse. The What's recourse that? is, and again, there are were, there were two separate motions putting... Well, answer that way. question. What's the recourse? The recourse is to sue Dewberry. And they, they did, did sue B Dewberry. I'm sorry? They did sue Dewberry. Correct. And that case was decided by the court which found that there's a contractual requirement that a condition precedent be met. The condition yeah. precedent being met is that they have to bill in the correct amounts in accordance with the contract, which they did not, and they have to submit reports that are acceptable to the city, to HRO, which has the responsibility. I thought that the reason that you didn't pay them 
was because you, uh, your defense was, well, we never got paid by the city program, and so we're only paying you when we get paid. We didn't get paid, you don't get paid, end of story. I thought that was your defense. That is kind of the defense. There's a pay if paid clause that yeah. makes a condition precedent that says, we don't get paid, you don't get paid. The reports that were submitted by NTEC that dealt with lead assessments Correct. were not appropriate in the view of Dewberry. They were not identifying so, so where if they, So they're entitled to nothing for their work. Not at that point, Your Honor. What we did, the attempt to procure payment for them. We didn't say, we didn't get paid, so you didn't get paid. We said, let's try and help you get paid. Let's attempt to procure payment. How do you do that? There are two ways, two things that are required to procure payment. One is that the reports have to be acceptable to HRO. Dewberry cannot submit reports that say there's no lead in these houses when it believes that there is. But we didn't stop at that and say we're not going to pay it. But I, I, I thought that the reason, I didn't think that was the reason for not submitting the reports. I thought the reason for not submitting the reports was that uh, they had submitted requests for higher payments than had been contracted for. Two issues, Your Honor. One is the invoices. The invoice had contract rates where they were gouging the city and billing in inappropriate rates. Not that they were gouging the city. They said, I think we should be paid more and expected you to submit that request. I thought Which, that's what the record shows. That, so your characterization of gouging the city, I think, is a bit over the top. Your, your Honor, they were overbilling more than what was in their contract rates. The and, they, and they said that to you. They didn't slip it in by... As a surprise, they told you, I think we should be paid more. Correct. Especially since every time we submit a date for inspection, you don't show up. That's not true. They said that they should be paid more. Dewberry, upon receipt of that request, immediately passed it through to the city. The next day, when the city said they were not receptive to it, and Tech again said we want our rates increased, Dewberry again immediately submitted it to the city, and the city said no. All of that is in the record, right? All of that is okay. in the record. And on the third time that the city said no, Dewberry said, look, we have a unit price contract here. You bill for the unit price multiplied by the quantity. The city is not receptive to that, but we want to help you. So let's add different line items. Tell me where, putting aside the unit prices, which are agreed upon, and theirs was among the highest of all the subs, give us what is it costing you more? Is it training people? Is it back office overhead? And we'll create a separate thing. And NTEC said no. So Dewberry then went to NTEC and said, you have to bill in the right amounts to get paid. Okay. Repeatedly, in the record, over and over and over again. Okay. And NTEC said no, we did won't. Did NTEC get paid for any of the work that they did under this project? Yes. NTEC got paid for their first invoice of the four. Mm -hmm. After that, the problems were discovered with their reports. We're dealing with And then lead. nothing was paid. It was like 1.4 million that was on the next three invoices. Is that, that was it? on something? That, that was on the next three at now, their inflated okay, prices. Let, let me ask you a question. Okay. So what you said sounded very reasonable, right? The way you laid it out. So after they submit invoice number two with increased uh, 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 billing numbers, and the city gets back and rejects them, and you tell them it's been rejected, they send you another one, you submit it again, it gets rejected again. Uh, was there ever a request by you say, look, just, we're not, we're not gonna pay you. So why, why, my question is, if they're not getting paid on number two, why would they keep on working on the work for invoice number three, the invoice for the work for invoice number four uh, when they're having this issue on invoice number two? That's an excellent question, Your Honor. Thank what you. was done, <laughs> what was done, and the, and the answer is baffling. The answer is baffling because what the record reflects is that on February 11th, Dewberry said the rates authorized on the contract are the only ones that you can bill on. Please correct it. On March 7th, We've received uh, invoices that are still at the wrong rates. Please reflect it. March 12th, these rates are not in your contract. You must bill at the right rates. March 18th, 
under the current contract terms, and NTEC will only be able to bill for the current approved rates. July 22nd, and I could go on and on and on of the request, and at one point, Dewberry said, please submit the corrected invoice using the approved contract rates. If we can get you more on it, we will. So you're, so, so you're, so when I'm gathering from what you're laying out in terms of the record here, if they had just done what you told them to do, they probably, or could have, more likely than not, gotten paid. That would have satisfied the payment end of it. The second end of it is you have to submit reports that are acceptable. But yes, on the payment end of it, absolutely. On the, they got on it, the that, that would have dotted the I, they would have been conforming with the contract, and that was it. And there was nothing in the record that, that had them coming back to you saying, for some reason, explaining why they weren't listening to you. Was yes, there? Yes, there was. Uh -huh. On July 23rd, Entex says that the revising the invoices would create too much confusion. Please pay us the amounts we invoiced. Now, uh, let me ask you something. <clears throat> I would imagine that as work is developing, and certainly before you paid the first invoice, you checked the work of that first invoice, no? It, it's not that simple, Your Honor. We're dealing with- Really? Yes. So we expend thousands and thousands and thousands of city dollars, pay contractors, and don't check their work? We do check their work, but we can't check every single line item and every single report before payments are made. Okay, so, so, so explain to me how, see, because I have a real hard time accepting that you allowed a contractor to do work on invoice number one, invoice number two, invoice number three, invoice number four, and then suddenly you discover that the work is not, not good. It, 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 it just never ceases to amaze me how you don't discover that after the first payment. So you let the contractor use his materials, his workers, his time, continuing to build out your stuff, and then later you say, eh, you know, the work wasn't that good. It, that's not what happened. They started their work at the beginning of January. When they're out there on the site, what's, what's happening on these sites is these people that have had their homes damaged by the hurricane had a grant money in order to have remedi remedial work done if necessary. HRO did not want to inconvenience the homeowners, so they required that damage assessments be done, asbestos assessments and lead assessments all at the same time, 10,000 homes in a concise period of time. NTEC goes out there and they're doing their lead assessments, these XRF guns and everything else. Dewberry is there to make sure everybody is doing what they're supposed to be. There's no situation where you say you're doing it wrong. It's like, some, it's like a, a, a doctor taking an MRI. There's nothing wrong with them taking the MRI. It's reading the results. Those results did not come into Dewberry for four to five weeks. So they started in January. So all of the work on invoices one through four was done in four to five weeks? No, the work on invoice one was done in four to five weeks. Right. Not the work, was, the work was done, the <laughs> reports came in, okay. in four to five weeks. All of the work by uh, NTEC was done between January and April 15th, I believe. Okay. That's all the work. As soon as Dewberry noticed that there were problems with it, they notified <coughs> them immediately. The first problem that was raised was they were not taking dust wipes, which were required. Children were present, they were required to take dust wipes, they weren't doing that. That was noticed in the field, and they were advised, did you take dust wipes? They said, no, we didn't. We didn't know we had to. They said, where well, there's children's present, you have to. The second problem uh, that was discovered was there was no location. There was a hot read that there was asbestos uh, lead present, but it didn't say where. So you're not going to tear down the entire house. And they said, we've got a hot read here, but we can't tell where it is. Got it. You have to give us the location. As these problems continued. And, and where, and where in terms of their invoicing you for in, in terms of their doing the work that led to invoices two, three, and four, did your notice to them come? Did I notice, did we notice what? So did you give them this notice before they had done the work that led to invoices two, three, and four? Yeah, at, as it was discovered, I think invoice two came in in March and all of this was happening in March. So as it was discovered, and then that led to a deeper review. And remember, there's hundreds of contractors out there doing this work. Okay. That led to a deeper review 
of NTEX reports. And one of the big issues that raised, what, what ended up being triggering it, was these inconclusive results. Okay. These XRF guns, where you take the lead readings, they have their own performance characterization sheet. So that's why you're saying there's two components to the payment. One is the, you know, if you follow the, the strict schedule in terms of how much you're going to charge, and then the report aspect. And the report aspect is we're telling these guys there are problems here, and they're, they're going ahead and doing the invoices, but not correcting, or at least as we're telling them, they're still going out there continuing their same method of, of collecting the data. Correct. Not making any adjustments for what we're telling them. Correct. And, and what we did was we didn't stop it at that and say, we disagree with your reports. The ultimate decision is made by the city, by HRO, under the prime contract, which is incorporated by reference. Can I, can I ask you one other question that I um, was grappling with? The plaintiff in this case filed a public improvement mechanics lien, correct? Correct. And uh, what happened? That claim got dismissed also? Yes. That was motion number two. There was four motions that were made. Right. Is that part, that's part of this appeal? No. The, they did not appeal the ruling that the public improvement lien was discharged. But they, they subsequently raised this whole point about the private. Correct. Uh, which was, came afterwards. We know there's a motion about that. Which is what the subject of the motion is, so I don't know whether any of our papers have been read on that. But they filed a public improvement lien. They defended it. They actually discharged it, filed it again. That was the subject of motion practice. That was the subject of a motion decision, and it has not been appealed. Okay. On appeal, they didn't raise any issue about private liens. And in fact, during the three and a half hour oral argument, Justice Crane, out of intellectual curiosity, said, well, what about private liens? Are there private liens here? And that was never brought up by the other side. Yes, it was a light bulb, so they brought it up here. OK. okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I just want to know, Your Honor, the motion, is that something that's decided? That will be part of our decision. Thank, Thank you, Your you. Honor. People versus Wilson. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honors. Good afternoon, Elizabeth Caldwell on behalf of Mr. Tristan Wilson. May it please the court. I plan to focus on Mr. Wilson's uh, four cause challenge to a juror and his pro se request to the extent there's time for both. The court violated Mr. Wilson's constitutional right to an impartial jury when it denied his counsel's four cause challenge to a prospective juror who waffled on her ability to set aside her pro police bias. The back and forth between the prosecution. Well, was, she, was she not? rehabilitated sufficiently? And if not, why not? No, Your Honor. So when you read the entire colloquy uh, as a whole, which, we, which the Court of Appeals says that we must, um, Ms. Ms. Marcus first you know, fully acknowledged that she has this bias. She volunteered it herself. Then uh, the prosecution said, asked her, um, and she said yes, that she could evaluate all of these witnesses' testimony in the same way if she was instructed to do so. But that was not the end of the inquiry. Defense counsel then comes back to her and presses her on this. And at that point, Ms. Wilson, or, sorry, Ms. Marcus um, reaffirmed her earlier statements, saying that she would be more likely to believe police officers. And at that point, there was no further inquiry by the court or by any of the parties to assure itself that she could, in fact, set aside that bias. And I thought there was an additional, was. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she yeah. said something else. Right. Yeah. During the, the, um, he, she was asked whether she'd be more likely to believe a police officer based on her respect for her uncle was, uh, was accurate. She said yes. Then the counsel asked, um, if you're selected, you determine the prosecution has not proven uh, defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, you will find defendant not guilty. Is that going to be a problem for you the next time you see your uncle taking... And she said no. Talking about your experience here and the fact that you found a defendant in a criminal case not guilty. She said no problem. Right. And so counsel uh, did a, a, a question of everyone on the panel asking whether everybody could be fair and impartial uh, and no one... Uh, and, and could be fair and impartial and, and no one said that they could not. Could be fair and impartial jury if the prosecutor does not prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, so that, that last statement, 
does not actually go to the relevant question here, which is whether... No problem where she responds, no problem where she's asked whether or not she could, if in fact the people failed to prove the defendant to go beyond a reasonable doubt, she could in fact find the defendant not guilty? She says that she would have no problem in her relationship with her uncle, but that doesn't actually bear on whether or not... Uh, uh, To me, that's stronger than, yeah, I could be fair. Because having... Uh, family members as as uh, law enforcement and having to uh, stand up to them after acquitting someone would be something that someone who has great respect and reverence for police would not be so sure that uncle would not be unhappy. Uh, To me, that was very powerful. Respectfully, Your Honor, I, I disagree with that reading of that statement. I mean, she, it may be that it would be a difficult thing to um, have a relationship with her uncle after an acquittal, but that doesn't actually assure the court that in this case, she would treat police officers' testimony just like any other. And here, this is a case that hinged on police officers' testimony. But it was more than that, because the prosecution had also asked her concerning the ability to follow the instructions of the court. And that is the, the more basic question. That and whether you can be fair and impartial. The more basic question is whether you can follow the instructions of the court. So regardless of the fact that she said she spent a ton of time with her uncle in uh, California or wherever, and and was aware of the trials and tribulations that he went through as a detective, she said that she would be able to follow the instructions of the court in that you cannot give the testimony of a police officer any greater weight than you would give the testimony of any other witness. Right. We, we don't dispute that she says at one point, yes, I'll follow those instructions. But what follows is what concerns us. After that is when she reaffirmed that she would be more likely to believe police officers. And that called into question. You know, if he had left it at that, if the defense counsel didn't follow up the next question, maybe you have a bit of a stronger yeah. argument. I mean, he, the, but the problem with I have is that the defense counsel did follow up to clarify it. Twice. If he had just left it alone when she says, yeah, to the prosecutor's question about, you know, giving the uh, police officers a little bit more weight, just left it at that, you might have a stronger argument, but that's just for me. Right, I, I guess... I think you uh, might just, talk to the pro se part. Let's, well, yes, you I'll stronger. give you another minute. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honors. Yes, so Mr. Wilson's fundamental right to self-representation was also violated here when he twice stated unequivocally that he wished to proceed pro se, but no trial judge ever conducted any inquiry whatsoever. When he was sent to the, go ahead, Barbara. I I was just wondering, did, uh, I looked at the record, I think we all did, did did he really pursue that? Did the defendant pursue that? Or once it got to the trial court, it just seemed to, that that argument seemed to have disappeared. So here, the, Mr. Wilson had, had made these requests two times, and at that point, it was incumbent on the court to actually follow up and assess whether Mr. The problem is that you have a, uh, uh, an upfront part say, okay, I hear you, I'm making a note of it, uh, but I'm gonna defer this decision to the trial judge, which quite frankly is the appropriate thing to do, right? So now he gets in front of the trial judge and right before hearings commence, He says, excuse me, he wants to talk to the judge. The judge stops him. Again, appropriate, because you don't know what they're going to say, right? No, talk to your lawyer. I don't see anything else on the record after that. Am I, did I miss something? Because I will go back. But I don't see, and and I'm sure you are familiar, I've written on this subject. So I I understand the issue. Right. Your Honor. I I don't see the record in front of the trial judge that would have forced the inquiry that you say would have been required at that point. You're right, Your Honor. You're not missing anything. But, but our position is that Mr. Wilson twice invoked this right. It's clear that the next, the next stage of this, uh, the, the McIntyre framework, is that the court at that point has to assess his ability so is it to waive your it. your position that if the defendant through his count, through, says he wants to represent himself in the pretrial proceedings, and the pretrial judge says, raise it in the trial court, are you saying it's the court's obligation to then raise it, and if the court doesn't raise it, that that's a violation of the defendant's rights, even if the defendant says nothing to the trial judge? That seems to me to be a a very 
like her <laughs> new rule that you're asking us to make. And I want to piggyback on that because my understanding was this, this quote unquote invocation of his uh, desire to go pro se was made via letters that he wrote to the court. So Is that correct? That, he wrote one letter and then he also had an oral colloquy right. with the court. And at that point, the court said, he recognized, the court rec recognized immediately that this was a request to go pro se. He said, I'm gonna defer this. I'm making a note so that the, the court is aware that this is on, this, is on been, this has been surfaced. Mr. Wilson would like to proceed pro se. And at that point, our position is that Mr. Wilson, uh, that the court should have ensured that Mr. Wilson had the assessment of his ability to waive that right as he requested. And here we have again, so someone who- Are you asking us to adopt a rule that if the pretrial judge says, raise it with the trial judge and the defendant doesn't, that that's a denial of someone's right to go pro se if they say nothing to the trial judge? Well, I think here also it's important to note Wait, that Mr. Could you answer my question? Um, we are asking the court to, I don't think it's actually an adoption of a new rule. We're just saying that. Well, that would be a new rule. Yeah. That would absolutely be a new rule. And you have to agree that the pretrial judge would not be able to make a determination for the trial judge, right, of the defendant going pro se? So would he or she be asking? able to make that determination? We're not saying that there could no, be no deferral here. We're just saying that once Mr. Wilson had invoked that right, he was entitled to an, a colloquy to assess whether he could actually waive that, waive his right to counsel. But isn't it incumbent upon him then to bring it up before the trial judge? I, I mean, and, our uh, position Before you is, answer that question, did he still have the same counsel before the pre-trial judge and at the trial judge? Did he have the same counsel? He did, yes, Your okay, Honor. So, so the counsel was there when he made that pitch to, when he made that pitch to the pretrial judge that he wanted to go pro se, correct? So something must have happened between the pretrial and the trial stage that they got they they found they got back on the same page and maybe he decided. And, and we'll explore that because there was a discover his initial complaint was that he wasn't getting discovery, and perhaps the reason it wasn't mentioned again was because he was no longer upset about that. But we'll, we'll address these on things rebuttal. on rebuttal. Thank okay. you, Your Honors. Counsel? Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Samuel Goldfein on behalf of the people. Um, just with respect to um, the last point, something, something did happen at the, um, at the, that changed the defendant's opinion about this request that when he asked to go pro se, because he, he submitted a motion requesting a new attorney and, and a letter that said, I, oh, I wanna go pro se. And in that letter, he explained he was only going pro se, requesting to go pro se because he wanted documents that hadn't been turned over. Right. So when he raises this complaint in front of the, the uh, calendar judge, Justice Wiley, Justice Wiley says, you know, I'm gonna make a note for the trial judge, he defers the opinion, but he then goes on to address the substance of defendant's complaints about counsel not opposing consolidation and about this discovery issue. And he explains that defendant had all the documents that were discoverable at that time. Defense counsel chimed in and explained as well. And the documents that defendant wanted, when the people turned them over, everybody assured defendant that he would have them. So his complaint wasn't, I want to go pro se full stop. It was, I want these documents. He said it explicitly. I would not have sent this motion if I got right. the paperwork. So that because my experience usually is if someone really wants to go pro se, it gets pursued and pursued, and the judge explains um, why it would be a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. and he said, but if you want it, and, and usually there's a lot of conversation. I, I'm, I mean, it's not in this record, and maybe that maybe that's why. I don't know. Maybe there were other reasons, but it, it seemed to have stopped once he got into the trial judge, and he never pursued it any further. It, it stopped right, right there. That was the last time it's ever mentioned. It's mentioned once in writing before this appearance. It's mentioned at this appearance. Justice Wiley clears the air. He explains the defendant, you know, it's expected that counsel's going to change his opinion on the consolidation motion when he learns more about the case. And from that point forward, defendant never makes a claim about it again. I mean, there's two more appearances where he says nothing then in June. It's not, it wasn't at the hearing. It was before the hearing still. He says, excuse me, your honor, which is the same thing he said to Justice Wiley. And Justice Wiley said the same thing that Justice Satzinger says, talk to your lawyer and then talk to me. But the first time defendant said, no, no, it's very important that I speak up. And he, and he, you know, he had something to say. The second time that happened, counsel related that he had spoken with defendant earlier. Defendant wanted the grand jury minutes. The court granted that request. So it appeared at that point that defendant was getting the benefit of counsel and his problem was, was solved. He was getting the documents that he wanted. Okay. So I think that was perfect. Um, I, I, I neglected to bring in um, copies, but your honors issued a decision last week, uh, People v. Eric, that I believe is remarkably similar to the fact pattern here, is sort of an equivocal request overshadowed by a request for counsel and then a deferral to the trial judge. So I think that's uh, on all fours there. With respect to um, Ms. Marcus, the juror, um, she was fully rehabilitated. She was, she was upfront and candid with the people. The people asked if anybody would be more willing to believe the police officer. She raised her hand and volunteered. 
my uncle was a, was a detective, I'm close with him, I would be more swayed by the testimony. As soon as the prosecutor explained what the law required of her, she said she could follow the law. That position never changed at any point. Defense counsel asked her if it was accurate that she had previously said that she was close with her uncle and be, would be swayed by police officer testimony, and she said yes, because that was his true statement. But in response to his question, is there anybody who couldn't follow the law and treat a police officer the same? She was consistent that she could follow the law. If there are no further questions. I ask that you affirm and rest on my brief. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Your Honors. Hey, counsel. So, counsel, now that you've had a few minutes to think about it, I would really appreciate it if you're asking us to make a new rule that if there's a deferral of a request by a defendant to go pro se to the trial judge, it is incumbent on the trial judge to bring that up, and if the trial judge fails to do so, that's a denial of the defendant's right to represent himself? Are you asking us to make that rule? I'm not asking you to change the rule that, that has been established in the longstanding framework. What I am saying is that on this record, I don't think that there's an abandonment of this request. Um, what we have here is Mr. Wilson. So what, what sign is there of it not being abandoned? There, there are a few different things that distinguish this case from other instances of abandonment. So first, Mr. Wilson had requested to proceed pro se. He said that even after the court explained um, why there might not have been a motion to uh, not to consolidate the cases, Mr. Wilson says, absolutely, but I also want to proceed pro se. So it seems like he's, he's voicing here an independent basis, if I may finish briefly. Um, he's, he's voicing an independent basis that he wants to exercise this right, and he's stating that in very unequivocal terms. Then he's told by the trial judge, bring this up in front of the, the trial judge. The moment that there's actually a firm trial date set, Mr. Wilson tries to speak up, this time for a third time, and we don't know what is, the record does not say what he was going to then say. Exactly, oh. the record doesn't say exactly what he was going to say. We have had cases where defendants who wish to go pro se, but defendant wants to go pro se, trust me, my experience, they will say it at every possible moment in the proceedings. <laughs> They will say it 10 times in the proceedings. I want to go pro se. He's not my attorney. On this record, I can understand your argument on some records, but on this particular record, he never raises it again. And to my colleague's point, I don't see how you can then put it on the trial judge to then say, I see that a month ago or whatever, when you were in the pretrial, uh, before the, the uh, pretrial judge, you said you wanted to go pro se, you never followed it up. You haven't said anything now. Do you still want to go pro se? Why? I, I don't understand how we, on this record, or why you would put that onus on a, on a trial judge. Our, our position here is that Mr. Wilson unequivocally invoked this right. He then tries to speak to the court again. He's shut down from doing so. And, and for that, um, there was a violation of his right to rep represent himself. And for that reason and the others in our brief, we would ask the court to vacate his convictions and remand for a new trial or reduce his sentence in the alternative. Thank, Thank you, you so all. much. Okay, and last but not least, you've been waiting so patiently. Board of Managers of 150 East 72nd Street versus Rich. Rich. I, I, I said it wrong the first time, so I'm hesitating the second time. Rubius estate. Rich Rubius, okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, Counsel, Your Honor. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Evan O'Brien from the law firm of Stemple, Bennett, Claim, and Hochberg for the defendant, appellant, and respondent of Vitruvius Estates. With the court's indulgence, I'd like to take a moment to say that the, the reason that I am here today is because of the sudden and unexpected passing of Richard Claim. Oh, I'm so uh, sorry January. to hear that. And uh, I know Richard appeared in this court many times. Yeah. He's appeared oh. before each one of you. Uh, <laughs> He wasn't always the easiest person to get along with with his adversaries, but he fought very hard for his clients. <laughs> Counsel's chuckling. Sorry, sorry. Um, and, so uh, sorry. He will, he will be Our great. condolences to his family. Be great and thank you, thank you, Your Honors. And, and, and I also point out that these, although my name is on the reply brief, uh, he, he passed literally only a couple of days before it was filed, and, and it, it, was, it is his brief that, that was filed. Okay. Thank you. Um, my adversary will say here that the, uh, this is the defendant's fourth attempt to dismiss the plaintiff's third cause of action. And it's technically true because there was a pre-answer motion to dismiss, an appeal, summary judgment motion, and now we're here again on appeal. But it's really the plaintiff that's exhausted uh, all of its bites at the apple here. 
Their construction defects claim relies exclusively on the HCLA report. Uh, there are virtually no details in the HCLA report. Oh, are, uh, are you kidding me? That, uh, that was a it's, very, that was like a it's, it's literally kidding. hundreds of pages, Your Honor. It was a 250 Honor. page report. It had all kinds of it, things. It may what do you more, mean there are no details? It may even be more than that, Your Honor. But with respect to the claims that are in the complaint, it's just page after page after page of filler. There, there's, there's really, there's virtually no details in the complaint, excuse me, in the report. Are you, are you claiming that you don't know what the plaintiff is alleging as the problems? I know what it is. It's those odors, it's those hot walls, it's the <laughs> pipe issues. I mean, I could go on and on. I know what it's about. You don't know what it's about? Your Honor, we know what's in the complaint, but we also know that there are disclaimers in the offering plan. We know that, but you can't disclaim certain. Uh, what was that case that Judge uh, uh, Judge um, Weber and some of the other panelists might have been on? I mean, there were they they said that you lost can't, con space condominium. Uh, and you, you can't uh, disclaim against work that you say you're going to do, like you did in the Fifth Amendment, if you do it. If it, if it creates hazards or it's in violations of the law, I mean, those things you can't disclaim for. You can't have an as-is for that. There is no allegation here that there's been a violation of law here, Your Honor. There's a, there's of the, course there is. They say that there is, in a, there, there is not enough insulation. There is not a fire stop gap. Those are absolutely violations of, of law. And you can't write those off. Your Honor, with an as-is clause. Respectfully, Your Honor, uh, as was the case in the in the, uh, with the with the building involved in the Chelsea 19 matter. This is a 100-year-old building, and there is an as-is clause in the in the offering plan. And as-is for a 100-year-old building means that the purchasers need to do their homework. And they need counsel, to do a proper you, investigation. Counsel, if we were going to, if you were correct that you are released by the disclaimers in the offering plan, then we would have come out differently on your motion to dismiss in the first place. But we decided that against you, and that's because we didn't feel that the disclaimers were sufficient to relieve you of any obligation to do the repairs. Respectfully, so you're Your back here essentially making the same argument that you made on that motion, which you lost. Respectfully, Your Honor, we believe that, that because that was a motion to dismiss that was on appeal, there was a different standard applied No, there. of course there is a different standard, but if, if you're now saying that you should win here because of the disclaimers, then you could have made that as a motion to dismiss on documentary evidence. And obviously, we weren't you know, impressed by your argument. And it's not, only not a as is. It says the property is offered in its current condition without any obligation on the part of the sponsor to make any repairs or improvements. That's exactly right, Your Honor, in its well, current condition. Except that's not, look, that's not what the agreement had, right? You, there were certain items that had to be repaired, notwithstanding that as is clause, and then you entered into a Fifth Amendment with, at, which added additional repairs that fall outside of the as is clause. And as my colleague has said, New York law does not permit parties to uh, enter into contracts that violate public policy. You cannot build a building that is not up to code. Respectfully. You cannot contract for that. Respectfully, Your Honor, this building was also, built. Also, I want you to eliminate your respectfully because we know what respectfully means in that context, okay? <laughs> Just make your argument. The building is over 100 years old, Your Honor. No, a lot of buildings in New York are over 100 years old. So that means that a new owner can resell apartments even if the building is going to fall down on top of the tenants? No. Your Honor, we're not talking about buildings that are falling down. So are of you we're saying that buildings over a certain age are not um, <laughs> covered under the, the law in terms of what has to be done or what doesn't have to be done? What I'm saying is parties are free to contract to sell a building in any condition, including if it is about to fall down. Uh, but what happened here is there's an offering plan that, that indicates the condition of the building, uh, um, that indicates that the, the building will be sold in its current condition. Okay, but, but with all, I mean, even but if with I, all due I agree respect, with everything counselor, that... <laughs> with all due respect, again, if there are violations of the law, then I don't understand why those violations, how you would be able to contract those violations away. There are no building violations that are part of the record here, Your Honor. Well, I was, I was going to make reference what I was talking about before. It was a case that... 
Judge Manzanet Daniels and Judge Weber and I were all on a few years ago, Board of Managers, it was versus SDS Leonard, and it right. specifically mm -hmm. says, to the extent the first cause of action alleging breach of contract is based on items that are hazardous, dangerous, and or violate the law, that is exceptions to the as-is clause. The as-is clause does not bar the claim. So, I, I, I mean, I, you can't just say that the bill, we know the building is old, but, um, and, and that you were fixing it up and you were selling it, and nobody expected you to do everything. I read the contract, but you can't get away with some of these other things, and it's at least an issue of fact. I, I disagree, Your Honor. I took out the respectfully. That I, I realize you do. Thank you. And you'll have time on rebuttal. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Honor. It's very nice to be back here again in person. Yes. And my condolence as well to Mr. Klayman. He was a very, very worthy adversary. Your Honors, with respect to um, the sponsor's appeal, Unless the bench has any questions, I'll rest on my brief as far as that goes. I'd like to address our cross appeal. Now, part of, part of the somewhat interesting motion that, that, that the sponsor made was to bar us from, in, it, I don't even know how to explain it, uh, to indirectly amend our complaint. Now, which you mean? never officially asked to amend, but Judge um, Sherwood, I think, treated it as an, uh, deemed it as an amendment, a request that's for right. amendment? That's right, that's right. I mean, what we had here, paragraph 64 of the complaint, listed the 11 or 12 most dangerous conditions that the Zimmerman report uh, uh, found. We said it was including, but not limited to. Now, I've been doing this a long time. I've never known any rule that says that you have to put in every single item in a complaint or the complaint is defective. Now, this complaint has already been found by this court, as my adversary concedes, to be proper, affirmed by this court on appeal. Judge Manzanet, Judge Weber, Judge Ong were on the original panel. 3013 says that you have to give notification of your claims. Now here, we have so much notification of the claim. What the sponsor does not mention is that the second interrogatories, it had the report, uh, it summarized, every, it summarized every, every violation and every particular um, statement to the offering plan was listed in there. So, and my, 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 what puzzled me is, is that you only responded to the second set of interrogatories. You were responding to questions being put to you, and then the court struck the, your responses. Am I correct? Is that what happened here? Well, it, it didn't strike the responses so much, but just said that we were limited. I mean, the way that I read, read it is that we were limited to the 11 claims that we listed in paragraph 63 of the complaint. Which again, what's the purpose of discovery? Disco and, and by the way, by the way, they had the uh, Zimmerman report, we gave that to them immediately. They had it since 19. They had it before they made this motion. And I would only, uh, and I would only submit that if, even if we were looking to amend, which we weren't, because I don't think there's a need to. But by the way, it's my burden of proof. I have to prove my case when I get there. <coughs> So this, these different attempts to try and knock us out for the fourth time. It's not like you're pleading a slip and fall outside of the complaint, right? I mean, this is all the building. Everything's still within the building. That's correct, Judge. That's correct. So in any event, Your Honors, I would, I would ask you, please, to just, just modify to the extent that denying the motion in total. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel, you'll have time on rebuttal. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, the, 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 as, as you pointed out, there was no proper amendment uh, or attempt to, uh, to amend the complaint here. Um, there, was only, there were only interrogatory answers. There was no proper motion. Uh, but Justice they were Sherwood to amend the complaint. They were answering your interrogatories. Why was it appropriate for the court to strike their answers to your interrogatories? There was no motion to, dis to amend. Then the 55 claims are then out. They, they, they sought to add 55 additional claims through interrogatory. I thought, I thought that 
you submitted, you sent interrogatories to the plaintiff, and the plaintiff has to respond to the interrogatories. That doesn't mean that they're amending their complaint. I mean, that would, that's discovery. You ask them lots of questions to get more details, and they respond to them. Now, if they can't prove them at trial, then they're going to lose them, but they had an obligation to respond, so they respond. Why can't? That's not, an, that's not the same thing as amending the complaint. I mean, we've all done a million cases with discovery. They respond, and now you have more information, because you said to me, you don't know what, they're, what they were suing, and I said, well, I do. I don't know how come you know. What's the old saying? Don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. <laughs> what happened here? I think. Your Honors, I, I respectfully disagree with the uh, um, with with the, the concept that a, a land, uh, that a, a two willing parties cannot uh, a contract to sell a, a, a building in a, in whatever condition it might be in as of the, the date of the sale. That's exactly what happened here. Um, there is there's but these been are no actually, showing. You're yeah. actually a sponsor of condos. It's not like you're selling the whole building. It's a little bit but different. But sponsors there, of right? condos, Your Honor, are not required to build to bring their buildings into brand new condition. Nobody, yeah. nobody said that that's what you had to do. But there's something in between a building falling down and a building in perfect condition, and your, that's what your I think Honor, is Your Honor, there's been on. no allegation of a building falling down, and indeed. My, my adversary used the word dangerous here for the first time. There's never been an allegation that anything here has been dangerous. And I, I, I really do object to those characterizations. I object to characterizations of the building falling down. This building is a class A building with million dollar condominium units in it that are selling for far more than the initial sales prices. This building is doing very, very well. This is not a dangerous building. This is not a building that's about to fall down. And quite frankly, I think the characterizations in, the, in those regards are entirely improper. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Have a good day.